Okay. Thanks for coming today. Um, obviously taking taking part in this um, webinar. Um, the idea for today is we are looking at obviously the principles of nutrition and applying the principles of nutrition to physical activity programming. Um, we're going to go through everything for your um, level three, obviously principles of nutrition, so that you you know it's going to help you towards completing your final assessment, your your practical exam. Uh, the practical exam is traditionally 30 questions. Um, you need to get 21, which is 70% to um, to pass. Um, we're going to cover all the criteria of nutrition. There will be other stuff we talk about just purely because I'm sure that you're going to have some questions around uh, the topic of nutrition anyway. Um, uh, any questions you've got, um, obviously you can ask me if it's relevant to, to particular slides. And then any other questions you, you might have, um, you might want to write down and then email them to me so that I can answer them in more depth. Um, I will go through some other stuff with you guys as well um, during during this whole process. Um, so obviously the first part is understanding the meaning um, of the key nutritional terms, understanding common terminology um, used in nutrition. We're looking at identifying the essential macro and micronutrients. Um, we're going to look to explain the key um, healthy in advice um, that underpins the healthy diet. Describing the UK dietary targets, macronutrients, um, identifying the different sources, and then obviously we're looking at professional bodies and offering um, our scope of being able to offer nutritional advice as well in this first section. So questions that would come up in the exam, you may get a question like, what is a balanced diet? Well, it's important to understand that a diet is the food and fluid that is routinely consumed. There's just food we consume on a daily uh, basis. Um, nutrition is obviously the intake and the digestion of that um, of the particular nutrition uh, or nutrients that we're consuming. Um, a balanced diet and healthy eating is a diet that provides adequate amounts of essential nutrients to promote health and prevent disease. What you'll find is this has been on several papers, questions that come up that are asking you what is a balanced diet. Um, I hate the term diet personally, um, just purely because it always scares people. When you're working with clients, just be aware of, of the term diet and how we use it very, very loosely. Because we want, you know, for you as personal trainers, obviously, I want you to pass your nutrition. So, first and foremost, the the balanced diet, a diet that provides adequate amounts of essential nutrients to promote health and prevent disease, is an adequate answer to a question. That's going to get you the correct answer. However, in the real world, if we are working with clients and we just we start talking about diets, it usually gets people scared straight away. So you just need to be really aware that when you're with clients, the term diet usually scares people off. Um, you know, we want people to live healthy and enjoy their food and not make it feel like that they're doing something wrong every time they put something in their mouth. Depends what they're putting in their mouth, I suppose. Um, some of the terminology we use within nutrition is obviously um, DRV, which is the UK Dietary Reference Values, um, Recommended Daily Allowance, um, Recommended Daily Intake, Glycemic Index, guided daily amounts. And you'll usually find this on a lot of food packages and different um, sources of uh, dietary information that you, if you went to the supermarket, you usually find this in the back of packaging. So what are our essential macro and micronutrients? Well, the micronutrients are the vitamins and minerals, and the macronutrients are your fats, carbohydrates, protein, and water. Today we are going to go through each one, we're going to explain each one in more detail. So the first topic will be stats, and it will go through the way through to water, um, and then we'll look at the micronutrients as well. So in the UK, what are we looking at? Based on energy intake, fats should equal no more than 35% 
So not more than 11% saturated, 13% monounsaturated, and 6.5% polyunsaturated in terms of fats. Protein should equal 10 to 15% of our diet, and then carbohydrates should be 50%, which would come from uh, predominantly unrefined complex carbohydrates. Now remember, this is going to be different if you are working with athletes, people that are doing a lot of weight training, people that are maybe endurance-based athletes. So these percentages may change slightly, but we are looking at the average person that's of a sedentary lifestyle. Yeah? Hello? Um, yeah. yeah. You're listening okay. intently, didn't you? Yeah. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> so UK diet targets. Some individuals may require, as I said, more or less given nutrients. For example, individuals who require higher or lower energy intakes. So for example, very active people or very sedentary lifestyle. Uh, pregnancy, the elderly, and it's for fat loss as well. So these percentages may change ever so slightly. Professional, professionals and professional bodies that you'd be looking at, um, nutritionists, dietitians, um, you might look at the scientific, uh, scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition, um, Department of Health, Nutrition Society, and the European Food Information Council. These things may come up in your exam. They may ask you about professional bodies um, and professionals that you can seek and find information, something that's regulated, so it's worth having a look. Um, on that note, do you know the difference between a nutritionist and a dietitian? One's got a degree, have a name in food nutrition, uh, that like a dietitian, a nutritionist which goes like a nutrition college as such. Okay. Um, They've both got degrees. Okay. The difference is, um, dietitian is is is, um, is a is the, is a word governed by law, so you can't call yourself a dietitian, whereas you can call yourself at the minute a nutritionist advisor, um, or a nu a food nutritionist. You know, you can use them terms quite loosely, but it's not governed by law. Where at the minute you're not allowed to say that you are um, a dietitian. Now, what's the difference? The difference is nutritionists can prescribe um, programs for people, look at people's um, nutrients and, and how they're consuming foods, whereas dietitians can be more to do someone that is of um, your specific needs in terms of clinical, clinical needs, something where someone needs to have a diet because of medical reasons. Like diabetes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's the that's the main focus on it. The dietitian can kind of do more medical in a way. Sorry, okay. Dietitian is yeah. more medical, yeah. Okay. So offering nutrition advice, the scope of the qualification, so instructor stroke PT, um, provide nutritional advice in line with the healthy eating guidelines, that's the key. And an individual require more complex dietary analysis should be referred to um, onto a dietitian. Um and on that point, it's important for you to be able to distinguish between evidence-based knowledge versus unsubstantial marketing claims of a supplier. So whenever you're looking at anything, you really need to look at stuff that's academically researched, that's evidence-based, where they've done a study of working with real people, um, because that's where you're going to get more information from. So many people, you would read a magazine and say, oh, you know, we're not going to be doing this anymore. We're not going to eat eggs anymore because they're bad for you. And my question would be why? Um, we're no longer going to have fat in our diet because it's bad for you. Why? That's what I'd be asking the question. You know, why, why is it bad? Um, that isn't my opinion, by the way. I think fats are really good for you. Um, but the point I'm making is that you need to be able to find the difference between evidence and just basic claims for marketing companies. Yeah, okay. um, reliable sources of these information are on the list here. So you've got reports and updates. Um, you've got the British Nutrition Foundation, the Department of Health, 
the Nutrition Society and the ones I particularly refer to myself personally would be the academic journals. So the Journal of Nut uh, Nutrition and Dietics and the British Journal of Nutrition. They're really good, give you really good source of information. You can also go on a website that you can look for different journals in terms of exercise as well as nutrition. Um, it's known as BASES, it's the British Association for Sport and Exercise Science. Um, and you'll get a lot of information from there. It's, it's really worth looking at. So that's really good. Sorry, Ben, could you just say that? Sorry, what was that, Edwina? Sorry, could you just say what that just a few seconds cut out that um exercise? British um foundation, sorry, the the name. Um bases. So it's the yes. uh British Association for Sport and Exercise Science. That's it, okay, thank you. That's all right, no worries. Okay, so next next we're going to talk about fats. So session names. Identify the fat, uh, the function of fats. Identify the different classifications of fat. Identify the energy value of fat. We're going to look at identifying fat food sources. Guidelines for consumption. Metabolism of fat. We're going to look at um, how fat is transported in the body. Um, the, the issues if you have too much or too little fat. We're going to look at cholesterol and healthy guidelines. Um, for fat as well. So the function of fat, um, what, what is it? So first of all, it's, it's going to help protection of the internal organs. We're looking at thermoregulation. Fat is going to assist in the insulation of uh, nerve cells, the uptake of storage and fat-soluble vitamins. It's going to help provide energy, a good component of, for the cell membrane storage and modification of hormones and it's going to help provide a source of essential fatty acids or at what we would know as our EFAs. So when we're looking at the classification of fats, what we're looking at, we're looking at saturated, unsaturated and trans fats. So the saturated fats are mainly from animal products. They're going to be solid at room temperature. Um, whereas our unsaturated fats are mainly from non-animal sources they're going to be liquid at room temperature they're going to break down into monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats and then we have our trans fats not not, uh, not naturally occurring fats um, and they're produced through hydrogenation so hydrogenation um, again trans fats are usually our bad fats um, you don't want too many trans fats in the body um, because it's no good um, that's a fire alarm, bear with me, it's gone now, it's still going. <laughs> um, so, energy value of fat, all fats, can you hear me with that alarm going off? Bear with me. Yeah. You burn it, something. Um, no, my partner's burning something. <laughs> um, She's breaking her fast, clearly. Um, so, <laughs> energy value of fat. All fats have an energy value of nine calories per gram. So that's really important to remember. Because when you're working out someone's energy intake, if you don't know these particular values, you're going to struggle straight away. So it's really important to remember what our individual calories are um, and our value of those um, calories. In particular, fats is a big one because there's a lot of um, information for you um, and a lot of energy that someone's going to consume if they consume a lot of fat in their diet. So, where would we get these sources of saturated fats from? So, you've got meat, meat products, butter, lard, cream, eggs, palm oil, and coconut oil. Our trans fats are going to be um, some vegetable spreads, baked products ready meals and fast food. We have polyunsaturated fats, usually found in vegetable oils, nuts, 
oily fish such as sardines, tuna, mackerel, orchards and trout. We've got monounsaturated fats. Again, we're looking at olive oil, avocado, seeds, nuts, rapeseed, and almond oil. Um, again, when, you, when you've got your manual, it's worth going through some of this so that you know, because there may be questions on where you would find certain fats, and these foods may come up, all right? Um, so sources of essential fatty acids. So the first one is your omega-3. So omega-3 is going to be found in the oily fish, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, walnuts, rapeseed, soybeans, and dark green vegetables. Where omega-6 is going to be found in vegetable oils and polyunsaturated margarines. So what are the benefits? What's it going to help? Well, essential fatty acids and health, you're looking at the protection. Um, a protection against heart disease, so it's going to help control our blood pressure, um, prevent blood clots. It's going to be, it's going to help inflammation in arthritis and asthma. It's going to in, um, enhance tra uh, transport of um, oxygen by red blood cells. It's going to help maintain the quality of our membranes and therefore may uh, present some protection against the anti-aging process. And again, just to reiterate about fats and the percentages, UK guidelines, again, 30%, but not more than 35%. You're looking at 11% saturated, 13% monounsaturated, and 6.5% polyunsaturated. So again, it's important to try to familiarize yourself with these because that's going to really help, especially with your exam. You may get questions on percentages of fats. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Is this presentation going to be online then? Sorry? Is this presentation going to be online? Uh, online, yes. Mm -hmm. Was that your question? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. It's a bit muffled today. I don't know why I can't. I don't know if it's my um, computer. Yeah, are you sound clear? I think my ears have gone deaf, that's why. So fat metabolism. Fat in the diet is mainly in the form of a triglycerides. Fat is broken down through digestion, which is known as catabolism, to so fatty acids and glycerol. So once digested, fat can be oxidized and used as energy, stored as subcontainous fat, which we don't want, used in the cell membranes and structured, uh, structural molecules or used to synthesize other substances such as hormones which is another thing that again fats are really good for um so fat tra um, transport fat and crystal need to be solidified uh, solubilized in order to be transported to where they need uh, they're needed in the body this is achieved by packaging them with protein into transport packages, what we know as plasma lipoproteins or PLPs. So these plasma lipoproteins are classified in terms of their dens uh, density. So we have LDLs and HDLs. Which one is known as the bad cholesterol? Anyone? Um, I'm not going to take the eye. I'm not going to take the eye. Yeah. Okay. LDLs contain high levels of fat and cholesterol. As they are carried into the body, they are thought to build up fat deposits on the arteries known as atherosclerosis, often called bad cholesterol. Who is it that said that? Is it you, Charlie or Peter? No, no HDLs contain low levels of fat and cholesterol as they're carried in the um, blood. They're thought to prevent the buildup of fatty deposits on the artery walls, so they're cardioprotective. And these are often called good cholesterol. You usually um, 
I don't, I've never really seen much on packaging, but flora, um, like the um, butter or margarine, whatever it is, <laughs> I think it's butter, um, actually gives you the LDLs and HCLs and explains the difference between the two. And it's the only one on the on packaging I've seen. So next time you have a look, you buy flora and then, then you can have a look. Okay, the role of cholesterol. Cholesterol is made in the liver. There's several crucial roles. Going to help um, brain structure, steroid hormone synthesis, and bile production to help break down acid. So, consequences of a high fat diet. Obviously, obesity is one of them. If you're taking too much, you're going to get fat. Or CHD. CHD stands for Coronary heart disease. Thank you. So consequences of a low fat diet, poor hair, skin condition, deficiency in fat soluble vitamin, deficiency in essential fatty acids, and then a hormone imbalance. When you are looking at um, low fat diets, you'll see it actually, you'll see it all the time in the gym. Um, you might see people that don't eat very much and you'll notice that you, you you'll see these people they're on usually the cross trainer or uh treadmill and they're, they're always doing cardio their hair's really thin um their skin's really bad um usually some people that have got really bad diets on the, they're on a low a low carb um sorry a low fat diet but even more so like you see it with people that if they've competed because what happens is the hormone imbalance affects them because they're not taking in enough fats in their body. So they become a bit hard to communicate with because their body's trying to function and keep them balanced, keep them in a, a, a state of homeostasis. But straight away, you'll notice people, because of their hair, the hair becomes very thin. Um, so I don't know if any of you have seen that in the gym, especially people that compete as well. Yeah. Um, so summary, health, um, healthy guidelines for fat. So just to summarize, limit the intake to not more than 35% of your total energy. In particular, limit the intake of saturated animal fats. Eat nuts, seeds, olive oil, and oily fish to ensure good intake of unsaturated fats and essential fatty acids. Eliminate trans, uh, trans fats from your diet by avoiding processed products like fast food and ready meals. And that brings us nicely to protein. Will it happen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you know, um, palm oil is a trans fat. Sorry? Do you know if palm oil is a trans fat? No. <coughs> it's not. So, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm on. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, because um, in the book it says that uh, cheaper products use um, trans fats, so that would be like biscuits and uh, and some sort uh, some peanut butters. Obviously, the there's quite a difference in price in some of the peanut butters, and I just looked on one of the cheaper peanut butters, and it had palm oil in, so that's why I put trans fat. Yeah. Now palm oil is saturated fat. Um, Usually, it's something that's, um, so you're looking at hydrogenation, so something that's been fried quite a lot, okay. uh, which is why your fast food is in that deep fried. Um, that oils tend to, it's different if you've got fresh oil when you fry it, but when you start frying it and frying it and frying it, it breaks down um, the molecules and it acts, and it just it just breaks down the actual um, oil itself and turns into the, um, hydrogenated fat which then turns into trans fats which is why um you know if you went to like like kfc for example they fry their chicken which I say they don't fry they don't, they don't put that fresh oil in every day they probably do it once a week yeah so if you're going to eat like that you're best off saying to them when do you clean when do you um, empty your oil drums and when do you put new ones in and then go that day <laughs> if you, if you was going to eat that. Or just avoid it at all costs. 
Yeah, or just, just get away from it, drive past it. <laughs> Goes Nando. <laughs> <laughs> okay, protein. So, there's your names. So, with protein, we're looking to describe the dietary role of protein. Again, describing metabolism of the protein, um, the structure um, in terms of amino acids. Um, we're looking at the significant um, significance of essential and non-essential amino acids. We're looking at um, protein requirements. What happens if you over-consume or under-consume pro um, protein? Um, we are also looking at identifying considerations for individuals, so vegetarians or vegans. Um, and then we're looking at obviously the energy value of it as well. So the dietary role of protein. Protein, you know, is about building and repairing body tissue. It constitutes of um, the membrane and may contribute to the body's energy needs as well when needed. Production of enzymes, hormones, and antibodies as well. So, protein metabolism. Protein is um, digested and broken down, so it's catabolism to form amino acids. Um, it's used to build and repair body tissues, so anabolism. Excess is transported to the liver and used as energy. So, do we know what the term anabolism and catabolism is, yeah? Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Explain to me if you want those. Anyone? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? So what is catabolism? Uh, the, it's a breakdown of muscle tissue. Yeah, so when we train, the reason we try to consume something after training is because our body would be, what we would say, was in a catabolic state. So we try to eat after training to make sure that our body doesn't eat our protein for energy, which in effect would result in us not being able to repair our muscles. So we'd want a, a carbohydrate source or something like that. Depends on what our body is using for fuel straight away. Are you saying we eat, but that's why we eat protein straight away after training, so that goes straight into building muscles. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. But it depends how much you've consumed over the day already. Um, you know, because if you've consumed that protein, it depends how hard your workout is. Some people don't actually work hard enough to actually utilize all their carbohydrate stores or glycogen stores because yeah. they're not being pushed to the limit. So that that's all dependent on on that really. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids in our body. So we've got eight essential, so primary, that cannot be made in the body, and 12 non-essential, which are secondary, that can be made in the body. Of the essential, do you see any, any familiar ones? Uh, yeah, the, the top two, um, and valine as well. Um, I see them in the branch chain amino acids. Well done. Thank you very much. So anyone, does anyone else have, um, take BCAAs? the drink before they train or during their train? Yeah, I do. You know what it can, what they say, what do you know what they can, um, what they contain? Yeah, yeah, I've got the whole list. So, most people when they're consuming BCAAs don't realise, they take it because they say it's going to help protein, it's going to help our bodies, um, it's going to give me energy. And when you ask them what it contains, what's in it, they don't actually know. So <laughs> it's important to educate our, our clients to make sure they know what they're consuming and why they're consuming certain things. Um, so straight away, most, pro, most um, branch chain amino acids, they should be containing isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Um, 
because it's going to be much more beneficial to them. They are the main major building blocks. The branch chain amino acids, the BCAAs, are the major building blocks of protein synthesis. It can help synthesize protein, which is going to help aid repair muscles. So, sources of protein. Where are we going to get our protein from? So, animal protein, meat, meat products, fish, poultry, and dairy products, and eggs. Non-animal product uh, proteins, tofu, pulses, nuts, grains, soyas, cereals, and TVP, which is textured um, vegetable proteins. Um, any of you guys are vegetarian? No. No. <laughs> cool. I'm recording this, so I need to be careful what I say when I talk about vegetarian. I'll get fun on YouTube. So um, we will come to that section in a minute. Primary amino acids. The human body must get eight primary amino acids from food. Some food sources of protein have a better pr uh, primary amino acid content than others. Um, these are mainly from animal proteins and soy-based products. And it's important to know that because if you are working with people that are vegetarian and they've not got enough protein and they're, they're always aching, um, their muscles ain't developing like you want them to. Usually, it's because you, you know maybe we're not giving them the right advice about the foods they should be consuming. Um, I've worked with a number of people that are vegetarian. It's hard to make you know, to get the protein in. You have to consume a lot of the soy-based products. Um, so it's important to you know educate our clients and the right foods, and that's our job as well. So you know, it's about giving them healthy eating guidelines and, and guiding them towards those healthy foods that they can consume to make sure that they're not um, malnourished, make sure they're not um, constantly getting injured during, uh, when they're with us um, because they're not consuming the right foods before and after workouts. So vegetarian protein intake, so what does it look like? So protein can be easily obtained from eggs, milk, cheese and soy products plus a combination of incomplete proteins such as cereals beans nuts and pulses and that's for a, a, a basic vegetarian but then if we're looking for someone that was like vegan protein is a lot harder to obtain um, the only proteins that they're allowed are from soy based products tofu and soy milk have any of you had tried tofu before uh, yes I had um, um, my sister in law, she's vegetarian, so she had like a, a batter tofu, and it was possibly the most disgusting thing I've ever tried. But I did try it because I thought, how can I, how can I give that to someone that's a vegetarian and not explain to them what it's going to taste like? Um, yeah. It's hard to tell someone that it's going to taste like cardboard. Um, <laughs> I marinated. I marinated it on the barbecue as well for a, a, another day, um, and it was like, yeah, flavoured cardboard. Um, but isn't it a quinoa a complete protein? Isn't that all eight? Sorry? Is quinoa a complete protein? Incomplete. That would be. So it doesn't have all eight. No. Doesn't. Oh, okay. I thought it did. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the rest must be uh, um, from a combination of incomplete vegetable proteins um, for the vegan vegetarian. So, what does protein look like? One gram of protein provides four calories of energy. Plain and simple. Um, we're going to need these values, especially when you're trying to work out someone's basal metabolic rate, um, which we'll talk about in a little while. UK dietary guidelines, you're looking at 10 to 15 percent of our total energy intake should come from protein. That's just average Joe, and this is the UK guidelines. So you'll find that most people, when they come to you, they're not consuming anywhere near their guided daily amount. They're probably consuming too many carbs, not enough protein, or or they they've watched too much TV and they're, they're all they're consuming is protein and no carbs. Um, so we need to be aware of our guidelines that we can give to people. And on that, 
there are other guidelines that you can look at. So protein requirements, so 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is sufficient for a majority of the UK population. Might that might come up in that might come up in one of your exams. So it's definitely worth um, remembering some of those figures. You never know. I hope you're practically making notes, Edwina. <laughs> making one, notes. 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram of body weight for endurance athletes, 1.4 to 1.8 grams for strength training. So what do we know about overconsumption? Well, nitrogen-containing nitrogen, um, nitrogen part is converted to urea and it's excreted potentially harmful for people with established liver or kidney disorders, which is why when the, the most infuriating part of what I do when I go to a gym and I train myself and I listen to um, uh, people that I know that have got personal trainers and they're like, yeah, my personal trainer has put me on a, a high protein diet, lim limited carbs. I'm like, okay, that's going to get them instant results because they're taking away their energy, their carb source. But also, one well, of the biggest problem is that they don't know if, if there's any liver or kidney disorders. How do you know if you, your, your client has a liver, other than asking them, how do they know they've got one? All of a sudden, they start consuming lots of protein because they've been advised by their trainer. Um, and then you've got you know, potential harm, harmful things that could happen to their clients. So we could, we could get them to do, um, get their bloods done so we know that they've got a healthy function body before there's loads of stuff on the internet now where they can get their blood tested and, and see if their body's fully regulated and, and healthy, that would obviously help. Um, but ultimately, they don't know that you, their clients have got these conditions. So that's the issue with giving someone a program that you're making certain foods out of their diet. Energy, um, energy containing part is either used by cells or stored as fat. High intakes of animal protein may lead to high saturated fat consumption, which may contribute to reduced bone density. So obviously, we're looking at the nutrition side of things. If they're training, well obviously if you're giving them high protein, that's all good. If it's coming from animal fats, then you're gonna reduce bone density. So you're gonna to need to make sure your client is doing a, a, a good, well-balanced, resistance program to help strengthen and increase bone density so it can, can help counterbalance the high saturated fat consumption if they're eating too much uh, animal fat from protein. Protein supplements, you need to note that you're not qualified to recommend protein supplements. Base any advice on health feeding guidelines, and if you suspect, uh, suspect a protein deficiency or feel that they need to increase in, uh, their intake, refer them to a dietitian for proper evaluation. So that's the important thing. You know, we're not, you know you're not rec you shouldn't be recommending, which is the hardest thing. There was um, I don't know if you know uh, this company called LA Fitness. Their PTs always given targets to. Um, their protein requirements and their protein targets um, so to sell products. The trouble is they're not actually qualified to do that. So it was always a, a worrying thing when you're trying to sell a supplement but actually technically you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's important to be aware of stuff like that. Under consumption though, deficiency is, um, is most um, developed most developed countries are very rare. So, you know, in the UK, deficiency is going to be rare. Under consumption of protein is going to be, uh, it's going to produce growth in children, muscle loss in adults, and you're going to be more susceptible to diseases. So make sure the kids are eating protein and make sure you're eating enough. Um, how are we doing? Are we okay? Yeah, good. To keep, keep moving on. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so next we're going to look at carbohydrates. So what are we looking at with carbs? So carbohydrates describe 
The dietary role of carbohydrates, this is the idea for this, uh, the learning outcomes for this section. State current recommendations for carbohydrate in relation to the total energy. State the potential energy content of carbohydrate in calories per gram. Describe the char uh, characteristics of soluble and insoluble fiber. We're looking at describing the characteristics of simple and complex carbohydrates. Um, and there should, there's going to be a list of good sources of carbohydrates and fiber that you'll be able to look at. Um, we're going to look at uh, glycemic index and glycemic load. We're going to look at the factors that affect GI and GL. The health risks associated with overconsumption and underconsumption. So, what is the dietary role of a carbohydrate? Well, the main function of a carbohydrate is to provide the body and the brain with energy. Carbohydrates should. Oh, what's going on? Where's my presentation gone? Okay, so carbohydrate should make up 50% of our um, total energy intake and it should be predominantly from unrefined complex carbohydrates. One gram of carbohydrates should provide four calories of energy per gram. All right. So what we're looking at, we've got fiber. So non-starch polysaccharides or NSP. As well as energy, carbohydrate foods also supply fiber. There's two types of fiber that you need to be aware of. You've got soluble and insoluble. Now, the soluble fiber is going to be found in like oats, barley, pulses and fruits, whereas insoluble fiber will be found from wheat bran, whole grain breads and cereals, and the skins on fruits and vegetables. So what does dietary fiber do? Well, first of all, it adds bulk to the diet. It's going to delay emptying of the stomach after a meal and remains intact as it passes through the aliment. Now, it adds bulk to waste, which helps with, uh, helps with elimination and may help prevent constipation or even bowel cancer, um, which some of the studies have suggested. So when we're looking at the structure of a carbohydrate, what we're looking at, well, we've got simple sugars. So we've got single sugar molecules, um, which are going to be found in like fructose, fructose and galactose. We have our dis uh, disaccharides, which is our two, uh, two sugar molecules. And this is going to be found in stuff like um, maltose, lactose, and sucrose. And then we have our complex carbohydrates, so our polyunsaccharides. These are long-chain sugar molecules. So in terms of where we would get these sources from, so our simple sugars are going to be found in the list below. So you've got table sugar, honey, marmalade, jam, energy drinks, milk, soft drinks. Um, this is stuff that's going to be Good to give you an instant kick. So if you're looking at doing an event, a sprint or something like that, you may consume this before the event so it gives you some sugar to spike spike your body so that you can you can go faster for a short period of time. It's going to give you a quick high, but then you'll probably crash because of the sugar. Whereas a mixture of both would be stuff like cakes, biscuits, pastries, sugary breakfast cereals. <clears throat> But the starch and fibres, so our complex carbs, are going to be found in oats, corn, barley, potatoes, rice, beans, um, lentils, chickpeas and vegetables. So the complex carbs are the ones you want in your diet. Um, for health, it's recommended that one's diet should be based on, a low, on low GI foods in order to prevent the most common diseases of affluence, such as coronary heart disease, diabetes and obesity. Factors that affect um, GI and GL would be stuff like the manufacturing process, 
the types of type of starch, the cooking methods, the food combinations, and its actual fiber content. So when we're looking at the overconsumption of all these um, carbohydrates, there's actually no known clinical condition associated with overconsumption of carbohydrates. What we do know is too many total calories can lead to obesity. So obviously, if you're consuming too much, you will put weight on. So you need to be, you know, it's, it's important. Too many simple um, carbohydrates, the so sugars, can lead to tooth decay. Overconsumption and obviously diabetes. Overconsumption of fiber can irritate the gut and decrease the transmit time of food, eliminating the absorption time of nutrients. Under consumption, so low carbohydrate diets can lead to inf insufficient glycogen stores, giving low energy and causing glycogenesis, so the breaking down of muscle for energy, and insufficient fiber intake lead to um, uh, constipation and digestive disorders. Obviously, this is someone of, sed of sedentary. There are lots of different studies now um, backing up low carbohydrate diets, medium carbohydrate diets. Um, so, you know, the timings of when you eat food, um, fasting, there's so many different things you can look at. I mean, obviously, we are looking at the basics of nutrition. And this is what would be our underpinning knowledge that we would give to clients that are complete beginners to set them set us apart from other, everyone else we would want to make sure we're giving the basic guidelines to get their body fully functioning before we had even attempt to try anything else or send them to a nutritionist or dietitian um there's so many different plans out there that people could could do obviously we need to make sure that you know we're not giving those plans out to people because we need to be qualified but if you can link with a dietitian or nutritionist, it's going to really benefit your clients as well. Um, next, we're looking at vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. So the first thing we're looking at is uh, give a simple definition of a vitamin. We're going to identify fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins, their functions and food sources. We're going to give a simple definition of minerals. Identify the key macro and trace minerals, um, their functions and the food sources. We're going to describe free radicals, photochemicals and antioxidants and how they affect um, how they have an effect on health. Um, we're going to identify contraindications, professional role bodies um, regarding supplementations and identify effective ways to ensuring that you have enough vitamins and minerals and antioxidants in your diet. So vitamins. Vitamins are organic chemicals naturally occurring in food. You're, they're required in tiny amounts. Essential. They're essential for all chemical reactions in the body, but with few exceptions, all have to be provided from the diet. And it's also important to know that they provide no energy. In your books, you'll get this, Peter, soon. Classifications of vitamins. So we have fat soluble and water soluble. So our fat soluble are the A, D, E, and K. Water soluble are our B group and C. So the fat soluble ones mainly supplied by fat based foods like butter, fish, oil. Um, they can be stored in the liver and fatty tissue. Daily supply is not essential and it can become quite toxic if you consume too much of it. Water soluble, so the B group and C, mainly supplied by water based foods like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, cannot be stored, so they're excreted in the urine. A daily supply is, um, is essential and they're non toxic. In your books, on manual, uh, you'll see in page 32, it will give you a breakdown of the different vitamins and the types of foods you can consume and the benefits. So it's really worth having a little flick through page 32 when we finish today 
um, just to give you a little bit more of an insight into the different functions and signs of efficiency. Um, that's obviously going to help your clients as well going forward. We also have minerals. Minerals are inorganic chemicals naturally occurring in food. They're essential for um, many chemical reactions in the body and structure of bones, teeth, etc. With few exceptions, all have to be provided from the diet. They provide no energy. Mineral, uh, the macro element is needed in larger quantity in, than the micro element. So in the in the box there, you'll see um, you've got your micro and macro elements: you sodium, potassium, calcium, copper, zinc, iron, and selenium. So your micro, uh, your micros. Again, food functions and signs of deficiency are found in the manuals between page 35 and 36 to give you a really good insight. There are again journal articles and other information that you can get on the internet. Um, in the back of your books you've got some reference stuff as well where you can have a look at the different texts where they got the information from. Does anyone know what a free radical is? No. Cool. So a free radical, an oxygen free radical are a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. Free radicals can damage a cell membrane, blood vessels, connect to tissue until they are quenched or neutralized by an antioxidant. Um, what foods do you know that contain uh, antioxidants? Like fruit and uh, dark green vegetables. Okay. So, Lemon. What was that, sorry? Lemon. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, when we're looking at our bright colored fruits and vegetables, these are going to help you with a good supply of antioxidants. Now, obviously, we know that if, we're not, if we've got free radicals in our body, um, they're obviously going to damage our cell membranes, connective tissue, blood vessels. So they're going to affect our bodies like in a really negative way. So we need to make sure that we're consuming enough fruits and vegetables in our diet um, to eradicate these free radicals. Now, what you'll find is good antioxidants include vitamin A, C and E, the trace of the mineral selenium. Many photochemicals, so plant compounds, are also good antioxidants. These contain um, carotenoids and flavonoids. Um, and as I said just then, obviously your bright colored fruits and vegetables are gonna really help you. Um, so it's important to make sure that we get our clients consuming lots of fruit and veg. Health uh, properties and antioxidants. So may have a positive effect on cancer prevention, lower cholesterol and reduce the risk of CHD. It's going to help support the immune system, have a positive effect on gut bacteria and protect against harmful bacteria and viruses. Again, Supplementation, there are various extremes of opinion surrounding supplementations and several contraindications. You're not qualified to recommend vitamins and minerals as, as a supplementation. Base any advice on healthy eating guidelines. And again, as we said before, if a vitamin or mineral deficiency, refer them to a dietitian for proper evaluation. When you're looking at maximizing the intake of, of these um, vitamins and minerals, so first of all, you want to get your clients to eat a wide variety of foods, choose unrefined options when you can, include at least five portions of fruit and vegetables daily. Um, on that, fresh or frozen, what do we think? Fresh. It doesn't really matter because frozen, usually it's, it's been frozen white, the, the fruit and vegetables is quite fresh anyway, so. Yeah. <clears throat> so as long as the fruit and vegetables are in, You've got a good fruit and vegetable that's been frozen at source. It's going to contain a lot of the nutrients. Um, so it's important to store fruit and vegetables correctly so they don't lose all their nutrients. Make sure you consume them before they start turning um, because they lose a lot of their nutrients then. 
cooking methods. So you've got steaming, quick, um, steaming or a quick fry is better than boiling. Um, it's a little bit like when you, you know, when you steam your vegetables. Um, usually, what people do is they they steam their vegetables. They your vegetables ain't al dente. They're usually soft. Um, people you over steam them. And has anyone used a steamer before? Yeah. And you, what you'll notice is at the bottom there's all this like green water. Now that stuff is where a lot of your nutrients are contained. So you're best off using that for a gravy, or like or a stock for a soup, or chill it and drink it. Um, mm -hmm. Because that will contain lots and lots of your vitamins and minerals you're going to need. Um, that have come from that particular vegetable. Okay, good to know. So, food for thought, excuse the pun. Okay, so fluids and hydration, that was our next macronutrient. So we're going to look at the function of water. Um, we're going to look at how the uh, body loses fluid. Uh, we're going to state how much water is needed per day. We're going to describe the potential consequences of dehydration, um, how to assess hydration, and then we're going to look at the effects of salute and electrolyte uh, for the absorption um, across the gut by osmosis. We're going to describe the um, composition of hypotonic, hypotonic, and isotonic sports drinks. Um, and obviously, we're going to look at the energy value of the state and the um, current guidelines from the Department of Health um, for alcohol. So, water. What is the, so the function of water? Basically, the water accounts for 60 to 70 percent of our body, which is why it's so important for us to be drinking as often as we can to improve our one transportation of the nutrients that is going to help supply around the body. It's going to help by having a lot of water in your body it's going to help remove waste products stuff we don't want in our body it's going to help regulate our temp body's temperature and then in an environment where chemicals uh, chemical reactions occur it's going to help that as well um, water loss occur, um, occurs continuously so breathing sweating um, excretion of waste typically 2.5 liters per day Water input needs to match water loss, otherwise you're going to become dehydrated. Water can be de um, derived from foods and fluids consumed. A well-balanced diet can provide 1 to 1 1.5 litres of water just from food. Has anyone had a um, use the juicer before? No. no. If you ever use a juicer, you'll be, you'd be, so, you'd be amazed by the amount of fluid that comes out of food like even yeah. like like a carrot yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. sorry yeah sorry i can i can yes I, yeah i have done juicing you lose a lot of the fiber don't you with juicing you say what was that you lose a lot of the fiber don't you with juicing that they say yeah i mean you, you i mean it's hard because you can you can make i mean i'd always i'd make a soup out of the rest of it here but you, yeah. you can, um, if you've got your, if you're using vegetables, for example, some of the, some of the stuff, the juice that comes out of them, you're like, wow, I didn't even know there was that much juice inside one of them. Um, yeah. This is how it's quite easy to con consume more water. Um, individuals may require more, depending on the energy requirements, temperature, and their actual body size. Consequences of dehydration, decrease in uh, blood volume, blood pressure, thus compromising the distribution of nutrients and oxygen, uh, oxygen sorry, around the body. A decreased blood flow um, to the brain, more headaches, poor concentration, and compromised motor fitness. Um, you're going to decrease in kidney function because water retention. A decrease in metabolic rate in all the cells, which consequences for uh, metabolic efficiency and weight management and an increased risk of poor digestion and constipation. Ultimately, one of the major things you should be doing as soon as you get a client is getting them or providing them with ideas of how to consume more water. Um, 
even if he's carrying a bottle with them around, um, they can buy these big water jugs now that are like two litres, two and a half litres with the handles. Um, you know, they can get used to carrying something with them just so that they've got stuff or even buying little bottles of water, putting one in their car, one in their bag, um, one at the desk at work, if they're working at desk, one in the house, so that they're always trying to consume as much water as they can. Because um, fundamentally, that's good. if obviously if, if water is, is important for the metabolic rate um, in all the cells and efficiency of weight management, that could be a really fix a lot of people. And usually most people are thirsty and not hungry. People usually have some want to put something in their mouth rather than drink water or drink a fluid because they actually think they're hungry when in actually they're they're usually thirsty. Um, you've got your urine colour hydrogenation level there. So next time you go when you go to the toilet today, off the toilet you get, have a look, see what colour you are. Are you hydrated or are you dehydrated? Um, yeah, it's important to to understand hydration levels for the obvious reasons that were that are listed just there. So how fluid enters the blood? Well, fluid moves across the intestinal wall by osmosis. Remember that it might be an important question coming up in an exam movement from a high to low concentration of molecules so sugar and salt so they contain sugar which is equal it which equals salute and salt or sodium which would be an electrolyte fluids can be categorized in relation to the osmotality depending upon the sugar and sodium content and this is where we start to bring about sports drinks so sports drinks fall into three categories based on their osmotality so you have hypertonic isotonic and hypertonic yeah so hypertonic isotonic and hypertonic um mainly and it mainly depends on the sugar content so a hypertonic drink hyper being high contains more sugar than the body uh, than the body fluids so water moves into the gut to dilute it before it can be absorbed it's used for providing fuel for it exercise is inefficient at providing hydration and it's going to be like fruit juice fizzy drinks energy drinks and obviously an overconsumption is going to have a negative effect on your teeth whereas an isotonic drink contains approximately the same amount of concentration of sugars as the body fluids so four to eight grams per hundred mils absorption for the gut is slightly faster than plain water given to faster hydration um, it's useful during exercise as small amounts of energy can be supplied as well. Whereas a hypotonic contains less sugar than the body. Absorption from the gut is slightly faster than plain water given to a uh, faster hydration. It's less useful during exercise as only very small amount of energy um, is supplied. Now, obviously, if you're doing an intense workout, you may need some some uh, some sugar in your body to help you keep going, to provide you with that energy to keep going. Um, but again, it depends how intense your workouts are. So, so what's the difference between a hypertonic and an isotonic? Is they both got well, hyper is got the most amount of sugar at eight grams, and isotonic is between four and eight. That's correct. Yes. So that's really the only difference. So hyper, okay, fine. So yeah, so eight or more, and usually it's, it's more. So if you look at Lucasade, an orange Lucasade, you'll find it's got a lot more than eight grams of sugar per hundred mil. Yes. So yeah, Lucasade energies, the the ones that are not the zero sugar ones. Um, yeah. So a diuretic um, stimulates the kidneys and excretes more fluid. So we've got caffeine, coffee, tea, cola, and energy drinks, alcohol, high sugar, um, high sugar content drinks, and this can accelerate dehydration. So, in terms of alcohol, the one you might be waiting for, um, not Charlie anymore. He's finished uni now. He's no longer at uni, so he doesn't drink anymore. Um, recommended 
guidelines for safe alcohol consumption. So per week, 21 units for males, females, 14 units. So per day, three to four units or two to three units for females. What does this look like? Are you ready to be shocked? Charlie, did you go out the weekend? No, I didn't actually. No. Do you, uh, when you go out, do you drink? Yeah, but uh, I, I don't really drink that much. Once, once a um, month, month, maybe once every three weeks. What do you, what do you, what would you consume on a night? Spirit and a diet mixer. <laughs> oh God, things have not changed since, since I was around. <laughs> right, so a normal night for me when I was out with my rugby mates would probably consist of about eight pints of beer and probably uh, they, I had to drink the beer because I used to like gin and tonic. Uh, <laughs> that was a girl's drink at the time. So <laughs> I would say I would probably, and even now I love a gin, so probably be about five or six double gin and tonics. <laughs> so. Mm. When you look at that in terms of units, what is a unit? A unit is half a pint of beer or lager, one 25 mil shot of a 40% alcohol, or a small glass of white, uh, of wine. Um, if you know anything about wines, you'll know that if you're drinking a glass of wine that's 9% volume, alcohol volume, that is the most disgusting glass of wine in the world. Um, it's <laughs> That is more of a dessert wine. Um, I've, Most I've, wine doesn't come in it anyway. Under like, you rarely find a wine now under eleven or twelve percent. Yeah, I mean, you that the nine percent wine would probably be a moscato um, or a dessert, like a dessert wine. Right. Okay. Not like the standard chardonnay. <laughs> no. 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 So you know, with standard chardonnay, you would probably be anything between twelve and fourteen and a half percent. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, you never get the underline. It'd just be too sweet. Um, so yeah, you're looking at units. Um, on a, I'd consume in one day when I was at my friend's probably easily, probably nearly two weeks worth of units. Um, so it just shows you. Um, you're so what, are you, too, what, are you, what are you better off doing? Are you better off having like two shots of vodka, say, so 50 mils of vodka versus, you know, three glasses of wine because that's what they always say. It always goes right. to the... This is the thing. When you're looking at digestion, the body yeah. will the body will attack um, the alcohol before the food. So yeah. what you want is if you're, if you're going to have a drink, you want something that's light pigment, it's easy to, um, oh, Matt, you're a bit late, mate. Um, so one second. Hello, Matt. Hello, Matt. It says computer audio is off, so I don't know if it's turned it on. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, Matt, you might... You can't speak to us because your audio is off. You need to turn it on. Um, I'll just carry on. Matt, you're very late. Um, we'll, do another, we'll do another one on another day if not. Uh, okay, so when you're looking at... Um, I'm, I'm lost. Matt, Matt you lost me. You said about the digestion of alcohol. So like digestive packs for alcohol. Yeah. When, you, when you're going to be consuming alcohol, the biggest thing is what type of alcohol you consume. Most people want to line their stomach with loads of, like a big meal to begin with, because they say, I want to line my stomach so I don't feel ill the next day. Yeah. That's usually real, like, a, that's a big no-no, purely because your body needs to digest that food to use it as energy, and so it doesn't store a subcontaneous fat. So what yeah. you'll find you're doing is, you're most people are doing the wrong thing. So if anything, you're best off having some kind of shake or, or some fish, some white fish, so that it can be digested a lot quicker. And then right. alcohol, anything with a dark pigment is gonna, your body's gonna really struggle to digest that quickly. So you're best off with something that's quadruple or triple distilled in terms of gin, vodka, um, 
And unfortunately, it's usually the expensive vodkas that are the better ones because they have just they've just been processed, manufactured a lot more better, a lot more efficiently. They've usually been triple or quadruple distilled. Um, so yeah, you I mean, ultimately, stay away from stay away from it all. But you know, you're going to work with people that you know have got a life and they do want to drink every now and then because they enjoy it. So the best that you them to have a gin or, or, or a good vodka really um with a with a mixer that's you know low in cal like low calorie mixer no sugar um there's no reason why you, you can't you know you can't have a drink but it depends how much you drink at that time yeah. Yeah. Okay. um little and often is not going to hurt you <laughs> you're a binger Okay, so alcohol, what is it? So you're looking at one gram or one meal is equal to uh, seven calories. So, you know, you can do the math when you're, when you're trying, you're with a client, if they're like, right, I want, I'm going to have a gin and tonic now. Well, you know that they need to times 25 by seven to give them the calories per drink. Is it not per pure alcohol? So, so, for example, gin forty percent, then it would be twenty-five mil times forty percent, and that would be the actual mil of the alcohol. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you know, you then you can work out the calorie content per per mil. So, and you, the thing is, you can then work out what they can have. So you might say, you might say to a client, "You're going to go out tonight." This say you when you're when you're consuming what you're consuming, they need to be aware of how many drinks they can have so that they know they're not gonna drink like two thousand calories worth of alcohol. Because obviously that's gonna be the worst case scenario is they you've been trying to get them in a deficit for weight management to lose weight and then all of a sudden they're they're in they're not in a deficit anymore, they're in a, a, a negative de deficit. Um, they're in a sorry, positive deficit um, because they've they've been dieting and exercising, right? Um, so yeah, you want to be aware of that. Um, so where are we now? So we're looking at the digestive system now. Any? Does anyone need a loop break? Does anyone want me to stop for two minutes? Yeah, coffee. No? Uh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Right, bear with me one, um, one set. I'll just... Uh, Okay, so the digestive system. We're going to look at des describing the two types of digestion, um, mechanical and chemical. Um, the name, uh, name and describe the main functions of each section of the alimentary canal. Describe how fats, proteins, and carbohydrates are digested and absorbed, and then the main enzymes involved. We're looking at um, the role of dietary fiber in efficient uh, digestion and elimination of waste from the body, and recognize when to refer a client to a GP um, for further advice if they need it. So this is your um, diagram of what would we are going through in terms of when food comes into the body and it goes all the way through and then back out. Um, it's worth, trying to remember some of this because um, obviously not now but in your books when you've got your books just to go through it and revise it you may get a question that asks you for the order so it's really worth um, having a look at this in more detail so there's two types of digestion you've got mechanical which is chewing um, or chemical which is obviously your saliva and hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes 
So mechanical, um, so you've got your chewing, food is torn, grinded by the teeth, tongue rolls food in small balls um, that are easy to swallow, whereas the chemical would be moistened by saliva. Um, and then this chemical breaks, de- um, breaks the breakdown of starch carbohydrates into sugar molecules. No chemical breakdown of fats or protein is in the mouth. The tongue also allows for you to experience taste, obviously. And then it goes to the esophagus. Um, and then obviously the mechanical process for this is um, peristalsis, which is the rhythmical waves of muscle contractions, which help push the food along the alimentary canal. Um, again, there is no chemical breakdown in the um, esophagus, not yet. And then it goes into the stomach. So from the stomach, uh, peristalsis continues. Um, this chum, this churns into a chum and mixes the food in the stomach. Chemicals, um, so you've got hydrochloric acid, breaks down the food into a liquid um, time. Digestive enzyme starts to break down the nutrients. For example, pepsins breaks down proteins. Um, small molecules such as water, alcohol, and some medicines, for example, a- um, aspirin, can be absorbed into the blood. Um, and then we have the small intestine. So parasitosis continues moving the full food along the small intestine after it's gone through the stomach, then it goes into the small intestine. More digestive enzymes break down the nutrients, for example, um, bile emulsifiers for fats, um, and, and then this is used. Um, complex structures of nutrients is broken down into usable components. Main nutrients such as fats, carbohydrates, proteins, vitamins and minerals and water are then absorbed into the blood. And this is all happening in the small intestine. And then the remainder of that, um, which is waste, enters our large intestine. So large intestine, colon. Peristalsis continues moving full, uh, food along large, the large intestine and then waste is produced from the colon of the rectum and expelled from the body. The chemical element of it is a partial breakdown of soluble fibres um, and the reabsorption of the remaining water from the undigested foods is then absorbed. And this is the last thing, and this happens in the large intestine. And then obviously it's expelled um, from the rectum. I hope no one's eating at the minute. Um, Important for efficient digestion. So when you're looking at dietary fiber, it's efficient digestion, keeps um, food moving uh, through the gut. It's efficient at eliminating uh, the elimination of waste. Fiber retains water in the colon, which adds bulk to feces, making it easily to eliminate. It helps prevent constipation and may decrease the risk of bowel cancer. So when to refer? Um, so when you refer a client to the GP, they have a condition that you sus- um, suspect they have a condition. So it might be food intolerance, a food allergy. Um, it's you can refer them to a GP. There are lots of practitioners now that actually do food intolerance tests, um, food allergies. Um, food intolerances are brilliant because it gives you an idea of what they could, shouldn't be consuming. Um, I had lots of clients that were um, eating certain foods, and when I looked at the foods they were eating, I just I thought it was fine. Um, but the problem you've got is that they might be consuming something they're intolerant to. Um, usually, that's because they're consuming too much of it, so it needs to be eliminated. Usually for like two weeks, and then slowly reintroduced in their diet again, um, and hopefully that intolerance still isn't there. Um, but there's loads of different companies now that do intolerance tests, and they're really good for for you to um, to do for yourself, for your own personal training, and to do with clients. So the healthy eating guidelines. So in this this section we're going to look at obviously um, we're going to go over fats and proteins and carbs again just to have a look at the of, to uh, reiterate the. The guidelines, we're going to the eat well plate, 
and describe portion sizes as well. So again, to go over, fats no more than 35%, protein 10 to 15%, and carbohydrates 50%, obviously found in predominantly unrefined complex carbs. Um, some individuals, as we said before, may require more or less given nutrient. Individuals who require higher or lower energy intakes would be, for example, someone that's very active or very sedentary. Um, anyone that's pregnant, the elderly, and then if you're looking at fat loss, the guidelines could be slightly different. This is your eat well plate. As you can see, fruits and veg on this plate is equal to actually bread, rice, and potatoes. Um, you get your meat, your fish, and eggs. Um, foods, drinks, high in fats or sugar, and then you've got food and dairy products. The eat well plate, remember that because it may be a question of how you would give someone a guideline. Um, there has been questions before asking you how you give some of the guideline and the evil pay was one of the answers. Um, nutritional food guide, so intent, um, intended to provide simple, healthy eating advice in a way that consumers can understand. Gives key messages in terms of quantity and the quality as presented in the eat well plate. The healthy eating guidelines for the NHS would be base your foods on starchy foods, eat lots of fruit and veg, eat more fish, cut down on saturated fats and sugar, try to eat less salt under six grams per day, get active and try to be healthy, um, try to be a healthy weight, drink plenty of water and don't skip meals. And again, this is your five food groups within the eat or plate and what it's actually looking for. So obviously bread, cereals, potatoes, fruits and vegetables, meat, fish and alternatives, dairy, food and drinks, high in fat and sugar. And it gives you some recommended intakes as well on the right hand side. These are all in your textbooks as well. There's a few more, it's a bit more in depth in your textbook as well, so it's definitely worth having a look through your, uh, your manual, sorry. So how much of each food group should we eat? Depends on energy requirements, obviously. So if you're looking at a male consuming an energy of 2,500 calories per day, carbohydrates 50%, so it should be exactly the same for male or female, but the only thing that changes is the energy requirements. So depending on an individual's um, energy intake they need, so they recommend males 2,500 calories per day, females 2,000 calories a day. The percentages don't change, but obviously that's just a percentage. That's not actually the grams of, of how much carbs they consume in one day. Um, so we would have to work that out. <coughs> to give you an idea, the exact daily daily amounts, amount, <coughs> if you are. So some of the sedentary, they reckon 2,200. Some of the very active, 3,000. So females, 1,600 for sedentary and 2,800 if you're very active. Um, being very active, wouldn't, you know, if you had a desk job and you, was, you trained an hour every day, cardio and weights, that wouldn't mean that you're very active. Um, You'd have to be very active. Would be someone that was doing a job there on their feet quite a lot, um, and they were training. Um, because you think you got 24 hours a day, and you only do one hour a day of exercise. It's not actually. It's not actually a lot. It's more. It's optimal. It's more than enough. But when you consider it for guided daily amounts, um, it depends on what job you do. You need to be aware of that when you're looking at um, calorie intake or food uh, food intake for clients. So uh, Ben, yeah. So I'm a waiter. So am I, am I very active? Yes. Yeah, you're, yeah. Yeah, you're very active because you're on your feet all day, and then you train yeah. as well. So yeah, you are. You'd be classed as very active. I think so. <laughs> you know, Thanks. You ever, have you, um, if you have an Apple Watch or a or a Fitbit or something, can you put it on? Uh, 
and you record oh. your daily steps, you'll be so surprised. I have, oh. um, I do some work for, um, I do some assessing for another company, um, and I do stuff with uh, management qualifications, and they're. Um, I've, I was working with one of the um, sous chefs and a head chef, and I just happened to talk about fitness with him for his course, and he had nothing to do with his course. He was just talking about it, and and I went to. I said, "You keep your phone in your pocket all the time." He was like, "Yes." Yeah. So I said, "Give me your phone." He never keep your head, and he never even knew. And when he looked at him, he um, on one of his shifts, he had covered um, nineteen thousand steps in one shift. <laughs> Not bad. Just walking up and down, up and down, um, just up and down the kitchen. I was like, oh my god! So this is a classic example of someone that is. Um, he never, he doesn't train or anything like that, but he's quite lean, and he said he eats a lot of food, and that he would. He's like quite unhealthy in terms of you know you can tell he likes to drink, he smokes. If he didn't do the chef, he would be the chef, and he didn't move a lot, he would probably be quite a big guy. Because because he, he consumes a lot of food, but because he moves so much, his body's used to it. He actually said yeah. to me he, he had ten days off, and he ended up putting half a stone on. And I went, "Did you eat like you normally?" He went, "No, I had a little bit more." And I went, "There you go." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <clears throat> so your portion sizes table will be found in in your manual, page one three two. So that's going to help you. Um, looking at portion sizes. So this might, this, this, the chance that this might not come up in an exam, but it's just to give you more information as well. So it's definitely worth having a look through there. Um, again, summary for health, healthy eating guidelines, reduce the amount of saturated fats, include a wide variety of unsaturated fats, eat less animal protein, and include a wide variety of non-animal protein. Consume mainly low GI complex carbohydrates, and eat more fiber rich, unrefined starches, fruits and vegetables. Aim to consume at least five portions of fruits and vegetables daily. Try to decrease your salt intake, increase water consumption and cut down on diuretics, for example, caffeine and alcohol. Um, add a variety to your diet and enjoy your food. Ultimately, that's what we want. We want people to enjoy their food. If you're giving people a variety, it gives them a really good um, option of what they want to eat. It, it, it's not boring. There's so many people that they start dieting and they fall off the wagon because you know, they prep, prep all their food. They say, right, I'm going to eat five meals and have chicken, broccoli, and rice, or chicken, broccoli, and more vegetables. Or, you know, and, and, and it's just not sustainable. Um, and most people fall off the wagon because they've been, they've got so, such strict strict guidelines about how they or, or wrong ideas of how they want to lose weight. Um, you know, if you're if you're a bodybuilder looking for you know put muscle on, and, and you, you're going to need to eat the same stuff, and you're going to need to lead, lead really that boring type of lifestyle. But if we, we're training with that's like one percent of the population, but if you're dealing with most most people that want to lose weight, you know, this can be much more sustainable if they their variety in their foods, um, and that they know that you know what I can pretty much eat what I want as long as I maintain control of it. Um, control methods are really good. Um, I always get my clients to use my fitness pal. Um, I set, I find out what their basal metabolic rate is. That's what we're going to do next. So I, I look at what their basal metabolic rate is. And then once I know that, I can then say to them, this is what I want you to consume on a, on a daily basis. And then they just input the data into my fitness pal to just to keep a record of it. Um, and it's that that's designed to educate them. So they start thinking about foods they're eating. So they make healthy options, but they do it themselves. Sometimes if you tell people what, they, what, what to do, it only work for a certain period of time. Once they, they're not with you anymore, they'll usually go mad um, and you know consume whatever they can find when they're hungry um, so yeah it's, it's important to give them some some tools um, to help them useful resource um, resources you, they people can look at um, nutrition information obviously NHS choices development of health and diabetes UK 
trouble with some of the um, government-based stuff is that it based on the sedentary lifestyle. So if you're getting someone that's a little bit more elite, it, this may not benefit them. The biggest thing I can say to you guys is write everything down so that when you are making notes on a client, if something works positively for them, you've made notes and you can see how it's having a positive effect on them. So it's almost like you're doing mini case studies for every client you have. By making notes, you can see what went right and what went wrong. Um, you know, if my client's putting on weight, and when they were losing weight at one point, I would look to see what they were doing at the very beginning before they were with me, look to see what I did, what changes I made to make them have a positive effect, and then I look back at what I've done from now to work out why they're having a negative effect. Um, Self-reflection is the biggest thing. Um, if you can evaluate yourself and self-reflect on what you're doing with your clients by making notes, it's going to help you in the long run. Um, because you're going to have a much more benefit on giving them healthy advice. Because you're going to know what foods that they like and what foods benefited them last time. Um, so yeah, make sure you have, you have like a, a journal for each particular client, um, or even some notes on a on a, um, a spreadsheet so that you can always go back to and see what was working for them. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at energy needs of a human body so we're going to look at the Schofield formula and the PAF physical activity factors that are involved with that so we're going to look at how much carbohydrates fat and protein requirements are required in grams to meet someone's daily requirements so you will have two questions definitely on this section okay so make sure you I'll, I'll ex once I start going through it, I'll explain where you will have those questions. So it's definitely worth it because I personally think here you're guaranteed. You're, this is a guaranteed two marks. So make sure you you get this um, get these ones. So there's two marks there. So factors affecting energy requirements. You've got obviously activity levels, exercise, occupation, lifestyle, age, gender, body mass, um, body composition. Um, environmental temperature, diet, basal metabolic rate, so our BMR, and our thermal effect of food, so the TF. So BMR, BMR is an individual's basic requirement for energy at rest. That's important to remember. All right. So. BMR, basal metabolic rate, is an individual's basic energy requirement for, en um, for energy at rest. So the calculation, right, what I'm going to get you to do, whilst, whilst you're here and you've all got pens and papers, we're going to work out what yours is as well. So if you are a male between 18 and 29, your basal metabolic rate will equal 15.1 times your weight, which is in kilograms. So, Charlie, how much do you weigh at the minute, mate? Uh, 91 kg. So you're going to be 15.1 times 91 plus 692, which will give you a total. You're frantically doing it on your calculator now, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 2,066.1 Okay, cool So that at the minute for you for your calorie intake I know from having a chat with you the other day is low, isn't it? Yeah, it's low Yeah, so we're going to hold that hold that thought and, if, and hopefully you you got uh, the rest of you all doing your calculations Um. So you've got 2,000 and, what did you say, 60? 66. Okay, cool. So that's, that, that is your basic. So when you're not doing nothing, when you're feeling lazy and you're not training, that is what you need to consume. On a, on, like, so on your days off, if you, if you don't want to, like, let's say you was, let's say you're not training for what you're training, like for, for competition and stuff. If you was average Joe and you're you're not doing competitions, you're just training for fitness. So you're still doing everything you're doing, but you're not training for competitions. 
that is your basic requirement. So on a, on a day that you're not training, that's what you should be consuming, yeah? So that's Zero your exception. So on Sunday, when you're lazing around, not doing anything, feeling sorry for yourself, hating Monday to come, um, you, that's what you consume. But this is where it changes. So we have a physical activity factor. So our physical activity factor is dependent on all of these things here. So um, if you if you're not you know if you're not um, got an active job and you're you know all these different things, um, you're you're not going to be very active. You might be moderately active. Um, inactive would be you know that you're not going to be that. So I would you know for for me it was if you if you did your BMR times one point seven. Yeah. And what does that look like now? Uh, 3,512. There you go. So, so for example, these examples, you've got now 54, he's, a, he's 95 kilos inactive. So his BMR is 11.5 times 95, because that's his weight, plus 873. It gave him 1,966 calories. Once he added his physical activity factor of 1.4 in for an inactive male, it then give him an energy requirement like this, 2,752. So what are you consuming at the minute, Charlie? 2, so you consume 2,500, but you said to me you're on a cut though, aren't you? Yeah. What would you do if you was trying to uh, put muscle on or maybe put a little bit of bulk on? Yeah, well, at least three. Yeah. So there you go. So, and again, what you need to remember, the important thing with this calculation as well is one, it's, it's by no means not 100% accurate. So you need to be aware of that. And what else it gives you is here, if you see SEE, standard error of estimation, so that's 156. So that's usually 156 for or against. So you get to, you can play around with 156 um, calories, so to speak. So you can. Okay take it down if you need it to at any point. Now, if we break that down into simpler terms, so for example, this gentleman here, 2,752 calories is what, he's um, is, is, you know, what he needs to consume for an inactive male. If you look at his percentages based on the UK guidelines of 35% fat, 15% protein, and 50% carbohydrates, then you're looking at something completely different because you what you do is take those calories and you times it by those percentages and it gives you the total calories that they should be consuming. Now, if you look at that, okay, sorry guys. If you look at fats, so his fats was. 963 divided by 9 would give him 107, 107 grams of fat that he needs to consume. Protein would be 413 divided by 4, which would make his protein 103 grams. And carbohydrates is 1,376. Divide that by 4 means that he'd need to consume 344 grams. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Edwina? Yes, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm working it out while I'm speaking with you. Yeah, cool. So, so basically, all I've done is I've worked out his percentages. Yeah. So you can see he's out of, they've got, uh, so he was originally, his total calories are 2,752. He needs to divide this, say, um, his fats, he needs to divide it by his target of 35% of his total calories by fat. So he's times it by 35, it's giving him 963 calories from fat. Yeah. And then he's taken that 963 calories and divided that by what the energy value of one gram of fat, which is nine, which then gives him his grams of fat for the day. So what he would what he would then do is taking it further than what this actually shows you, because what most of, if I give you those figures, you go, this is what you need to consume. You're, and on my fitness pal, you'd be like, right, wicked, these are my limits. So I know what I can consume today. But this say I wanted him to consume it over four meals. 
I'd literally just divide it by four for everything. And in that way, he would know exactly what he needs to consume over four meals. So let's say he had to consume 100 grams of carbs, 50 grams of um, protein, and 25 grams of, um, yeah. of uh, fats. I'll then just I'll divide them by four, so I'd know he'd need five grams of fat per meal, ten grams of protein, and then twenty grams of carbohydrates. So each meal would contain that. If that was what I was going to do, if I kept it easy, because um, I can divide it over the meals. Now, the biggest thing for us as trainers is that making sure that our our clients and customers are happy. Now. In terms of making them happy, I would look at the um, I'd look at that and probably give them that as the whole num as the whole numbers like it is in red. The reason for that is because then I get them to make their own choices. They can use my fitness pal. They can select foods that they like. I can give what I would do is I'd give them a list of foods. So for me, I give my clients lists of foods that they of as options, and then they just pick choices from that food now i know those foods are healthy because i've selected them but what i've done is i've let them make their own choices on the foods they wanted so the onus is on them they're making a decision about what they want um are, you giving, the, are you giving them the serving sizes or anything from the food list or are you just giving them a list of foods i would give them a list of foods um and i'd give them uh I'll give them serving sizes, yeah. So I would literally say when I when I do mine and I break it down, so I'd say, you know, ten grams of protein is equal to so if it's chicken, I'd say these figures ain't correct by the way. I would make sure they're correct when I give them to the client, but I'm just throwing figures out. So I'd say like, oh okay, ten grams of protein um for chicken breast is equal to twenty five gram uh twenty five gram breast. So I'll be like, well, that's, oh, they say seven grams. So I go, right, okay, that's seven grams um, of, they say fats. They say there was, um, I had avocados then as well. So I go, right, I want you to have 25 grams of avocado. That's equal to seven grams of fat. So, and then I would know, right, they've still got 100 grams left. So they'd be able to work it out for themselves. So they have a list of food, a list of grams, a gram of um, protein carbs and fats so they know what they're consuming in each food now the good thing with my fitness pal is it does that for you already as well um, and yeah. then it gives you a total breakdown of what you're consuming for the day okay. yeah and so come on guys so i've just worked mine out and let's just say i'm trying to put on muscle and yeah. i i'm then increasing my my protein and and but then I still need I still need the carbs to have the energy to get through the workout. Yep. So I'm just am I taking away from some fats and increasing some proteins or how am I how am I working that out? So what so you've you've worked out your basal metabolic rate. Yep. Um you've worked out your physical activity factor on your basal metabolic rate, yeah? Yeah, I've done moderately active. Yeah, it's different. It's been moderately active some days and really active others, but I've just done moderate as a sort of a as an average, I guess. Well, that's, that's the good thing about about that uh, about what we're using is because you can use that as a tool. So I would do if I, there's days I'm not active, I would have less calories than days yes. when I'm more active. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I okay, so that's fine. And then and then on the days therefore so that's on the days that I'm working out and doing a lot of strength training, I'm just using those extra calories is what a balance of carbs and proteins and fats or more protein into the muscles. Yeah, as long as your as long as your um your your um percentages are are accurate for you, so depending on what you're you're trying to achieve. So for purposes of like everyone's going to have individual requirements, then that's the, the that's the thing. I've always said this on on workshops is no two people are the same. So yeah. 
always going to be slightly different for an individual. You're going to either require more or less protein, fats, and carbs. They're all going to, it's all going to be dependent on what you do for a job, you know, what your activity levels are, what your stress levels are, um, what you've got going on at home. Yeah, all these are things that are going to affect you. Um, digestion, your, if you're, you know, have you got a healthy gut? You know, bacteria in your gut, is it, is it healthy? Are you able to break down foods efficiently? So it's all these things that would affect someone. Um, okay. okay. So, yeah, it, and there's so many different factors. But all I would say is it's about not changing some, everything drastically. It's like making slight changes and slowly adding changes um, as the weeks go by, most people tend to just do a complete change. Their body completely gets shocked and then they become unstuck. Um, the idea is that you do small things um, that are then going to start making differences as you go along. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, right, bear with me. Can you see my screen again? Hello? Yeah, yeah I can see you. Oh, good. My screen disappeared again. Doesn't like me today. Oh my gosh, come on. Okay. Sorry guys, temporary glitch. Yeah. This should be an easier way of doing this. When my screen's, um, when you're looking at my screen, it's locked, it doesn't let me do anything. I can't skip anything and it just turns the slides off. Okay. Can you see the screen now, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, so when we're, in terms of what we're looking at for basal metabolic rate and, and we're looking at like obviously weight management, um, we've got like obviously very low calorie diets. Um, we're looking at obviously describing safe and effective strategies with weight management for clients. We want to describe um, cardiovascular training in a weight management program, resistance training, summarizing weight management guidelines, and, and obviously diet and exercise um, and daily living um, amounts of energy for an individual to help them uh, for weight management. So when we're looking at very low calorie diets, clients who want to lose weight will frequently opt for a very low calorie diet, which is obviously something that we don't really want them to do because they're going to be our crash diets or starvation diets. So this is usually fewer calories than their basal metabolic rate. This is what's then going to create what we call metabolic damage or metabolic syndrome. Um, and uh, we talk about that quite a lot in, there's a level four qualification called weight management and metabolic syndrome. And we talk about that 
um, in that. And what you'll find is with, with metabolic damage, just so many people go on these low calorie diets using, I don't know, like lighter life, herbal life, juice plus, where they're, they're drinking these shakes and the problem that you've got with them is that they're, kind of, they're consuming low, less calories. So if you're consuming less calories, you're obviously going to um, lose weight. But the problem you've got is when you go back to eating normally again, you're going to put the weight on quite fast. So what we're looking is for something that's, that's sustainable for a long period of time, something that people can do. Hence the reason why when you work out basal metabolic rate, you can tell someone what they should be consuming. They can then make healthy choices based on their macro requirement needs or their energy requirement needs. Most people can, don't realize they consume so many foods. Um, you know, I've, I've, I remember years ago, my mum uh, making dinner and um, as she's making dinner, she's eating it, all of our foods, like little bits off our plates or off the, um, off the tin as she's eating um, cooking the food at the oven. And when I look back now, she must have consumed like four or five hundred calories before she'd even started eating her dinner with us. Um, and it's so easy done. Um, Edwina, when you make dinner for the kids, do you, um, do you ever eat pick off it? Or did you pick off it? Yeah, when they're toddlers, yeah, you do. It's very, it's very easy to do. It's called, you know, it's, it's, um, I remember reading something about mindful eating, just being mindful about what, you're, what you are eating, because it's very easy to do if you're in the kitchen all day. Yeah. I, um, I made. I remember. I remember last year making. I made the kids like chicken fritters um, and wedges, and they left loads, and I was eating them. And then when I looked, I realised I'd eaten like four or five dippers. Yeah. And they were like hundred calories each, but they're only tiny. Yeah. When I looked, I was like, tiny. wow, I'm not going to do that again because I'd consumed like seven hundred calories. And then I went and had my dinner, which ironically yeah. was like a, a steak stir fry. <laughs> I was just like. God, that was a waste of time because um, yeah. I consumed like 1,200 calories in my meal. And it, it didn't occur to me until I, ironically, was teaching one of these nutrition things. I thought, you know what, I, I, I did that yesterday. Why, you know, why did I do that? But it, it's just because you get in that frame of mind. And when you, that's another, that's the, like the, the, one of the big issues I have with clients. Especially, what you've got to remember is if you've not got kids, then you know, you might not have done this, but you know, it, you'll get clients that have got children and they do this, which is why I thought I'd ask you, Edwina, because I know that I did it. Um, and I've seen my other half do it. Um, yeah. And before you know it, you've, you've consumed, the next, even if it's another 300 calories. Um, and we're talking about weight loss and how to lose weight. And then when we refer back to what I've just said now, you'll realize how important it is. So low calorie diets, what else do they do? We, they have psychological consequences of a very low calorie diet. It's going to have decrease a metabolic rate. It's going to decrease the efficiency of fat metabolizing and fat burning mechanisms. The loss of lean muscle tissue, um, keto aditosis, risk of nutritional deficiencies, um, rapid weight gain when normal eating is um, resumed and obviously yo-yo dieting this is what it basically is so for us we need to make sure that when we are with a uh, when we're looking after clients we're giving them the tools they need to make sure that their their, their bodies are optimal and that they're efficient for burning calories um, and you know, we increase their metabolic rate so if a crash diet doesn't work, what does? What can we do? Well, there needs to be safe and effective strategies for weight management. That's the key. So the safe, effective strategies for weight management need to be long-term. They need to be, as I said before, sustainable. And you need to create a steady energy deficit. So energy balance equation. Now, just to give you a heads up, there will be a question in this. I've seen, in every exam I've seen, there's been one question on this. This should be an easy one. If you're the basics of energy, if the person that you're dealing with has no um, metabolic damage or anything like that, and they're all fully functional, if energy in is greater than energy out, they're going to get they're going to put weight on. If the energy in is less than energy out, they're going to lose weight. If energy in is equal to energy out, they're going to maintain their weight. 
So creating an energy deficit is the key to weight loss. So how do we do that? So an energy deficit can be caused by obviously diet alone, exercise alone, or the best option is a combination of diet and exercise. But which is best for weight loss and changes in body composition? Now this is where, when I was saying about this part, about eating foods um, with your, um, when you're making food for people and stuff like that. We all got enough clients that have got kids and they're really busy and they're too busy to exercise, but they're going to stick to a nutrition plan. Um, and all of a sudden, they're nibbling on the kids' dinners um, because they don't, they're, they're what we call war babies and they don't want to um, throw the food away because they think it's bad. Um, there needs to be a mild calorie restriction. Typically, three to five hundred calories um, per day. So, basically, if you three thousand five hundred calories a week is equal to one pound of fat. So we need to have a five hundred calorie deficit per day to achieve that. So that's why it's really important to have that conversation with our clients that have got kids if they're cooking dinner to be aware that are you within your three to five hundred calorie deficit a day. To when you start eating stuff like that, this can usually be achieved by simply simple modifications of um, exercise and diet. If restrictions are too small or severe, then a crash diet response will happen. So you need to make sure it's a small response, so three to five hundred calories. Can I just say something on that? So if you've got a client and they say, "Oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. I can reduce those calories," and on you know, the, the, on you know, they, they train with you once or twice a week, and then on the other days they're doing, say, an aerobics class, or they're going for a, a light run. That you know, you don't know how fast or how far they're running or whatever. Then how can you then work out what they're then burning um, versus their calories? How can you work out what they're burning? What if they're not with you, Jimmy? You what if they're, yeah. they're doing a class? Yeah, so they say, okay, so I did a, you know, I did a metafit class, or they've done a, I don't know, body combat class or something. So then, how do you then work that out? Oh, okay, so there you go. So, there, there, this is a small, this is a small one. There is a real, there's a good one um, that you've got that you can access. Oh, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, I need to just find it first. I've got it in a manual of mine. I'll see if I can find it in the manual. There's a more in-depth one. But basically, this is works out the calories based on a 65 kilo individual. And it gives them an option of different exercises they'll be doing. Um, and it shows you the calories per minute that they could burn. Okay. Now, when, you, when you're with a client, um, obviously, you need to take this into account and think, okay, so what can they, what will they be burning? So you can give them a rough guide. But ultimately, you want to do that plus plus the food is really okay. good. Um, okay. Ultimately, you need to be patient. Make gradual uh, gradual changes to an eating plan and their lifestyle. Eat a well balanced diet. Don't go hungry or skip meals, and be prepared for, prepared for barriers and setbacks. If someone has a setback or a barrier. You know, tell them that they've done it, they've messed up. Tell them what an idiot they are, but then then bury, then bury it. You know, because there's nothing you can do about it now. Draw. I always say to my clients, look, you've done what you've done. Draw a line underneath it and just get on with it, because there's nothing you can do after that. So yeah. that's that's the biggest thing, because um, you know you can't change. You once once someone's had a setback you know, they're not going to be able to change anything. So, you know, it's really important to understand and, and speak to the client. Go, look, there's a good chance you're going to have a setback. And if you do, be open and honest about it. Because the biggest thing I, I, have issues, I used to have issues with was clients used to, they would, they would tell me. Um, I had a client and I used to go to her office and this is a true story. You just go to her office and she had all these Diet Coke. So she liked Diet Coke. She said, like, I like Coke. She's drinking full fat Coke. I said, but don't drink that. Try Diet Coke, if anything. To, yeah. And then obviously I'll wean her off the Diet Coke. But I went to a draw because I used to do draw tricks like I was in school with her. And um, she had all Diet Coke. 
front of the draw, and then when I moved the, the Diet Cokes away, the next row, they were all fat Cokes. Right, okay. So people, you know, people ain't honest with you, they're not going to get the results. And I said to her, like, I'm not here to, like, ridicule you and make you feel bad about yourself. I'm here to help you, and ultimately we're there to help people, and if they're not honest with us, then, you know, it's not going to work. You know, the biggest issue we have in the industry is probably steroids. And I always say to people, be honest with me. Because you know what? I don't actually care. It's, it's their individual bodies. So I'm actually not bothered if they take anything. If they want to take uh, in, uh, performance enhancing drugs, then that's up to them. I haven't got a problem with it. But I need to know if they're doing it because their foods are going to be different. Their training is going to be different because their their recovery rate is going to be quicker. Um, you know, so... These are all different things that I want to I want to make sure they're doing. You know, I want them to keep active. I want them to keep a food diary. By doing my fitness pal, that really helps because I can then log on as a friend of theirs and look at see actually what they're consuming that they're logging in. And then I've just got to hope that they that they maintain that what they're putting in is accurate. Um, if someone's got a lot of weight to lose and not losing weight, and you're training them hard and they're they're doing all these extra things that they say they're doing. The chances are they're lying to you. Um, you just got to work. And this is where we become a bit of like an agony on. We need to work out the psychological effects of them and why they're lying to us. Um, you know, why would they be lying to you? Um, and it's just sitting down talking to them. Um, that's the biggest thing with this. So, again, other strategies, obviously guidelines. You need to set realistic goals. If you if your trainer isn't setting you a goal or you haven't asked or you haven't set yourself a goal and told your trainer, then your trainer isn't training you. You know, they are literally just taking your money and then that's it. Right, anyone can beast anyone, but if you've got a specific goal, whether it be a competition, a photo shoot, um uh, fitting a dress that you've not fitted into ages, you want to look good for a um, a party or a holiday or anything like that you need to set a realistic goal for someone um, so in terms of weight loss a good guideline is 0.5 kilograms of fat per week and again as I said it equates to a deficit of 3,000 3,500 calories per week or 500 calories per day and it's so easy to um, not uh, to fall out of that deficit um, when I was doing competition for um, one, um, one of the girls that I used to train, she was doing a competition for fitness um, in um, like a, a bodybuilder show. And she wasn't losing the weight very efficiently. And I have just said to her, drink water. So anyway, when she came training with me um, to check in and everything, I said to her, I mean, what's that you're drinking? She said, oh, I'm drinking Volvic lemon and lime water. And I went, okay. I said, sugar-free one. And she was like, no. She went, what do you mean sugar free? I mean, when I looked at it, she was consuming fifteen hundred calories a week on water. Um, yeah. So, so she was within. So she was already like almost half of the. So it's zero point five. So zero point two five kilograms a week that she could have added to a zero point five if she was dropping that much. Um, she was out of her deficit to where I wanted her to be purely because she drank all that water. As soon as I changed it to Volvic plain water, you can imagine what happened. Um, I've got pictures on my Facebook. You, all of a sudden, she's got abs. Um, so she went from having no abs to having abs for the show. Um, and that was all just through drinking water. Um, but it was obviously water that was fine, that had sugar in it. So there's little things you need to be aware of. And that's why we keep food diary and keep a check of our clients so that we make sure we know exactly what we can do to change them. Obviously, weight management, you need to consume fewer calories than your BMR. Eat little and often. Choose low GI carbohydrates. Choose high fiber, low GI carbohydrates. Monitor progress effectively and increase activity and exercise. So just a note on that. Um, so the only time that you would do uh, damage to your metabolism is it when you're consuming fewer calories than your BMR? <clears throat> yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I read that wrong, didn't I? 
No, no, I was just wondering when the me- when the metabolic damage actually occurred. Yeah, that'll be when yeah when they're consuming fewer calories. So you'll find yeah. a lot like um because your calories went quite low on your show, didn't it? Uh, two thousand two hundred. That was at the lowest you ever went. Yeah. Yeah, see, so that's quite that's fine because you're going to be with, you know straight away you are still within your like um, your BMR. Your BMR is two thousand. So you was you were still well within your BMR, which was exactly where you want to be. So you you in effect still had another two hundred calories to play with to drop to drop lean to drop lean. Right. What well, you that's were current weight, which is ninety one kilograms. That's not what I was weighing before. Yeah, so you would have lost. Yeah, you see, you would have lost uh, muscle. And then yeah, again, this is another thing for you to think about as well is if you are a client that wants to put muscle on, if they're consuming too low, they will shrink. Salon. Um, so it's making sure that everything's accurate. Are you alright, Peter? Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry. <laughs> so I just I can hear it was you. <laughs> yeah, it was me. So I had a cough earlier. That's fine. No, that's, that's all. You're alright. I didn't want to have to call nine nine nine. No, no, you for that. I'm fine. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah. So that's that's the the guidelines for that section. Um, uh, so we touch on uh, fads and popular diets. We we touch on these a little bit, and so obviously you've got very low fat diets, high protein, low carbohydrate diets, food com- um, combining diets, or replacement diets, fat burning weight loss supplements, um, elimination of limited food diets, and rapid weight loss methods. Um, Good question to ask is: Does it take into consideration an individual's lifestyle? Um, you know, they, when you're when you're working out a, a, a weight loss program for someone, you know, does it set long-term plans for both diet and activity? Does it include exercise? Does it provide enough energy to meet the minimum requirements for basal metabolic rate? Does it include all the food groups necessary for health? And these these are the the biggest issues that we have. When we're looking at clients, so many clients I've come up and tried all these different diets, and and I look and I think, wow, you know, they've, they're, a lot of it is based on next to none in terms of re- research, uh, especially um, research that's that's evidence based. So, you know, it's it's about making sure that you can pick the right options for someone if they're going to do a diet and they're really adamant on it. It's their body. You can advise them, you know, not to. But if they're like, no, I really want to give this a go because all my friends are doing it, and you're like, well, okay, the best thing you can do is make sure that they're doing things right. Uh, make sure they're consuming enough so that they're within their basal metabolic rate. If they're not, con- like, for example, if they're doing like a ketogenic diet or a pay- uh, or a paleo diet or a um, Atkins diet where they're consuming high fats and protein, well. Okay, they're gonna not be having. They won't have no carbohydrates, which means the training session is gonna have to be different because for the first two to three weeks, they're gonna have no energy until their body switches over and starts using fat and protein for energy. Um, so, and these are you know, we need carbohydrates for energy, yes, but and that's what you're gonna say on your exam paper, just to let you all know. Exam paper, you need carbohydrates, but. I'm thinking outside the box for you guys because you know you're not you're probably stupid and if you if you're having like a a, a a carb no carb or low carb diet you need to be aware that for the first two or three weeks your body's going to feel tired you're going to get headaches they're going to be your clients are not going to have as much energy as soon as your body switches over and starts to utilize fats and proteins for energy then they'll start to feel good again. Um, Ultimately, if they're on a low calorie, a low carb diet, try to get their carbs in through vegetables. So they have more vegetables, so they're providing carbs through vegetable source than high starchy foods, which is usually what most people eliminate. They they usually have sweet potato, um, lots of vegetables to get their to get their carbohydrates in. Um, so you just got to eliminate this a lot of the starchy foods um, if they're on a low carb diet. Um, but it's just being aware of stuff like that to be honest. 
Um, ways to spot a bad diet provides fewer than a thousand calories per day, promotes rapid weight loss, has an unbalanced eating plan, promotes unrestricted amounts of certain foods, fails to make long term changes to eating habits. It's a little bit like these people that go oh, six week six week abs or six week food challenge, you know, lose lose four stone in six weeks and you know and it's kind of frustrating because you put the candles up really quick, but you're going to damage them. You know, so many, I've seen so many people on, on social media that do before and after pictures and do like a six week challenge or an eight week challenge with people. And yeah, you know, good luck, good luck to them. They're making changes in people's lives, but some of those changes are going to be negative because people are going to have metabolic damage. Because as soon as they go back to eating the way they did before, they could be really, really damaged unless they have a reverse diet where they slowly introduce their foods back in and trying to get their bodies back into their um, metabolic rate. What you've got to remember is with nutrition, it can be really dangerous. What you do is, is really important to the client. So, you know, as I said before, evidence based is the key. And if it's evidence based, and it looks good, you can try it, but make sure you're keeping a diary for that client so that you know what worked for them and what didn't. No two people are the same. So that's always going to change people as well. So you've got diet fact or fiction. So for example, some diets can help you lose fat from specific parts of your body. That diet, is that fact or fiction? Fiction. Thank you. Fiction. Eating late at night makes you fat. Fiction. So. what it is. Okay, so a healthy, healthy. They say it was. Um, they say it was chicken and basmati rice with vegetables. Fiction. It doesn't matter. Well done. What? Thank you. Oh okay. What you got to remember is, and it, so the, the biggest thing with, um, like most people don't eat, eat late at night. I was an advocate for this when I first started personal training. I've got, I probably, I probably dig out a thing what I said about losing weight, and it was more for people that just wanted a quick hit, a quick fix. And I said about it, eating after a certain period of time, and I got dug out by it. And when I look back now, I think, oh, you know, it was, it was more of a, a, a just a, a claim rather than evidence based. But when you look at the evidence now. Ultimately, when your body is at rest, when it's sleeping, that's when your body is more susceptible to grow, which is why it's important to get to bed early. So if someone wants to put muscle on, they should be going to bed earlier. They should be eating food before they go to bed so that they, they're, because that's when their muscles are going to grow. That's when their muscles are going to repair. Um, so that's when all the adaptations happen within the body. So ultimately, if you're going to bed starving, it's always going to be a slight issue because the body's going to need energy. Now, depending on the, the only way you're going to get fat is if you're consuming more calories. It's calories in versus calories out. So if I if I consume my food towards like throughout the day, but my last meal is at like eleven o'clock at night, as long as I'm consuming the calories I need for that day, I shouldn't really put weight on because that's my requirements for the day. Um, so you're saying it doesn't matter what time you eat those requirements, as long as you're within the requirements, you're okay. Yeah, I mean, it's different if I've, I've had my requirements, I've gone out with the boys, I then had a kebab on the way home, then I'm going to get fat because one, because <laughs> I've then got alcohol that's eliminating the whole process of um, breaking down my foods anyway, so it's just going to sit there. Um, so that's when all the, all the um, that's when it's bad. Okay. So when you get home, no more, no more tea and toast. Those days are out. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's 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 one of the things as well to think about. Um, eat uh, certain foods have fat burning properties. Fiction. Anything else? Anyone else? I'll say it's a fact. 
Yeah, certain foods can help. Um, there are some things like chilies, caffeine, um, cayenne pepper. Um, there are certain things that can, can help improve weight loss or um, assist in fat burning. But um, in terms of in terms of fat itself, it's most probably fiction because it's not going to be directed at fat. It's more to do with your thermal effects of food that it does. So by having chilies or caffeine, it's just going to increase the heart rate, which is going to help you burn more calories. So in terms of fat burning, no, not really. But in terms of helping you lose lose weight, then yeah, it would be. Creams, rubs, and lotions can help you lose fat. Fiction. 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 Yeah. Definitely fiction. Low, oh, on that note, has anyone seen that new that new thing that they've they've just brought out where you put the head monitor on and you strap it to your head? No. Oh my god, it's unbelievable. Right? So they've basically brought this thing out where it's like it's like a, um, a strip that goes across your head, it goes around your forehead, and then it, you have these two like little electrodes that clip onto the side of your head, and then they clips on, and it basically sends a signal to the brain that helps you, um, it makes your brain think that you're exercising, so it speeds up your metabolism. And they reckon within six weeks you start losing weight. You can't wear it when you're in bed, you have to walk, you have to wear it 45 minutes for five, at least five days, for it to have an effect, it's a new thing out. It's about 360 quid. Um, they've just bought Sank. If you ever, if you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about, but they've literally just bought it out. Um, it's absolutely hysterical. But they were, these people were walking around with these little things on their heads, trying to lose weight. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm, uh, I'm so tempted to get one to see if it, if it does anything for me before I knock it, because I'll probably slate it, everyone will buy them and get really slim, and I'll be like, wow. Don't get me wrong, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, like, whoever invented it is amazing. I think what an ingenious idea, because the amount of people that are not, wouldn't have a clue that would be buying these things. Um, but yeah, that's uh, fiction, by the way. Um, low fat or no fat diets are good for you? Fiction. Yeah. I have a slow metabolism and can't lose weight. Fiction. Fact or fiction? I think well, to an extent, it could be true because if they've had, if they've done metabolic damage, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Might, yeah, might hinder their chance of losing weight. But I wouldn't say that it's a valid excuse most of the time. Yeah, most people say I've got a slow metabolism. You're like, right, okay. That's the same as you know, as uh, I've got my, my mates at rugby, but they are propped forwards and they go, oh, I'm I'm big boned. And I'm like, no, you're 40 now. You're not big boned, you're just big. <laughs> um, so yeah, it doesn't work. Stop smoking will always result in weight gain. Fiction, because the people will eat more is because they just feel that they should. They yeah, but you say it's something in their mouth. Yeah, exactly, it's just something to do. Okay, eating disorders. Occasionally people develop underlining physical... This is really... I mean, this is an important one, especially for you guys, because you're going to see this in the gyms, you're going to see this with clients that you have. Occasionally people develop underlining psychological problems with their weight and body and image. They, be they may become more obsessed with food. And again, most, com most common of this are people that are competing and stuff like... Um, I'm, I'm picking on Charlie today. Um, Charlie, you, I bet you was you got totally obsessed with food and your image and everything. You was looking in the mirror, thinking you weren't right, weren't you, the whole time? I still say to a certain extent, no, I have an eating disorder. You say no or you do? No, I say no. I, I, even, uh, to a certain extent, I do have an eating disorder, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it, it really, you know, and it's, it's so easy. I mean, don't get me wrong, everyone gets it. I've, Obviously, January kicked in. I was like, right, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. And I got home. And she, my missus went yesterday. She went, is that what you're eating? She was like, oh, you're, you're getting an eating problem, aren't you again? 
I mean, what are you talking about? She was like, you're getting eaten from it. No, there's 500 calories on that plate. There's, that's no problem at all. And she was like, yeah, I know, but you'd use a much bigger meal. And I was like, yes, when I was much bigger. Um, <laughs> and it's like, the problem that you've got when you're looking at stuff like this is that um, you do, you, you we get fixated on our bodies. And actually, guys, nowadays, there's so many guys that are like it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it's it's just the nature of what we do. And then if we're, if we're aware of it, then, you know, I always say it's not a problem if you are aware of it and you can admit to it as well. Um, you need to be very sensitive, obviously, of the subject um, and you must approach it with caution because not everyone's going to want to talk about it. Um, I've had so many clients that I've had to pull up and talk about it just because they're coming into workouts and they're not training very well because they're not consuming the right foods. Um, and usually on, on the flip side, clients that I've had that are, are usually people that don't do, don't do it for shows. They're people that are doing it for themselves. Um, and they're consuming like ridiculously low calories and they're not following a plan. They're not following the guidelines that I'm selecting for them. So you need to just be, just be aware of it because it does happen. Try not to be tempted to uh, provide a quick fix solution as these are really serious conditions and they basically can prove, I mean, not for you, Charlie, your issue is completely different, but some of the conditions that you have, like for example, anorexia, bulimia, these are serious conditions. So these are the serious cases and you're gonna, these would be work for like qualified professionals to deal with. Um, there's information on the, on the links there um, that you'll have in your manual as well. Um, just to give you some advice, but some of the clients that I've dealt with, um, it's unbelievable. I mean, you need to make sure, I mean, you're looking for the characteristics, so severe weight loss, self-induced starvation, obsessive fear of weight gain, low self-esteem, fear of fatness, high uh, need for approval, social withdrawals, I mean, health consequences, you've got like high, hypertension, hypothermia, um, slow re uh, recovery from injury, reduced physical performance, um, you know, increased risk of bone loss and early osteoporosis. So, you know, it's, it's been aware of these signs, you know, uh, bulimia, binge in large amounts, large amounts of foods, um, starvation, low self esteem, excessive exercise. I mean, I know so many people that are bulimic in gyms, um, puffy face, hiding foods, um, secretly in, um, you know, health consequences like hypertension, dehydration, bowel problems, um, menstrual irregularities. Uh, some of the girls that I work with, um, are, you know, they've some of them in their, their 20s and they stopped having periods, their menstrual cycle stopped. Um, that was a massive thing for me because I was like, right, okay, what are you doing? And when I looked at their foods, they were consuming so less calories and they, their body fat was dropping down so low, they were having all these problems. And you can see their hair's really thin and it isn't very nice. And a lot of them used to, and you'll see this with actually, Charlie, you might see this with some girls that do competitions. A lot of them start having hair extensions. And the reason they have any extensions is because the hair's so bad. So it just makes the hair fuller. Um, so yeah, it's important to, to know stuff like this because it's, it's going to really affect um, affect clients. Um, Edwina, you work, you do train in like a, a big boy gym, don't you? Yeah, I do. And do some of the girls have hair extensions and stuff like that? Do you see it? Yeah, they're just very, yeah, you, you do see some very, you see some dangerously thin women working out, you know, where it's just, you really worry that they're going to like snap an arm or something. I mean, it's, um, and yeah, you do see some bigger, musclier girls with a lot of, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's extreme to say then, it's like you were saying, it's, it's, it's the irony of it being the unhealthiest kind of industry in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing. It's the most it's it's the most unhealthy industry. It's so sad, but it is. It's because you've got all the chance and you've got everything, all the tools you've got right in front of you to be healthy. Yeah. Um, but the yes. body yeah, the body dysmorphia is is the worst thing. 
for, and, it, and it's horrible. It's a horrible thing for people. Um, but these are things for nutrition you need to be aware of. Um, this is a, this isn't a slide for your exam. This is a sports slide. I don't know why it's on here. Bear with me one second. Oh, it's done it again. Um, I'm going to go to the toilet quickly then. Right, bear with me one second. I'll just get this up. You don't hear that. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, that's good. <clears throat> We've got. I've got. Um, I've got a puppy um, for Christmas. Oh, I love those. And then I and my other half just shouted out. He's got an infection in his willy. He's got pus coming out of it. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm not cleaning that one. She can do that. Okay, Pete, are you back? Here he comes. Here I come, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm back. The last section we're going to talk about now are food labels and um, recipe modifications. So again, we're looking at guided daily amounts of food labeling, traffic light systems, um, food packaging, um, uh, discussions on how nutrition, uh, we're going to discuss how nutrition um, claims are made on food packaging and can be misleading. So when you're looking at food labels, what information should we be displayed? Obviously the name of the food, the weight of the food, any special storage considerations, um, any indications of <clears throat> mineral durability, so for example, best before date. Place of origin, um, there's a chance that a consumer could be misled. Pictures on foods must be honest and not misleading. So for example, um, if it says, if you've got a yogurt and it has a picture of a apple on it, um, so you have an apple, I've never had an apple yogurt. If you look, if it's got a raspberry on it, and you have like a raspberry flavored yogurt, it has to be have it has to have real raspberries in it. If it has like a raspberry like character, you know, like the kids like little kids yogurts oh. have kind of it, it can be just raspberry flavoring or orange flavoring. But if the actual food is on the light, like if there actually is, the food is actually there it needs to contain it. A little bit like protein shakes. If a protein shake contains um, the actual, like shows a picture of an actual fruit or whatever flavors on there, it has to actually contain that flavor and it has to be the real ingredient. Otherwise it can just be a flavor. Yeah. Did you know that? Mm, I didn't. Animated yeah, so, so you'll get there's some protein powders out there. There's one that's like it's a berry protein, and it's actually got blueberries on it, and it actually contains it's got a, it's got a shelf life. It actually contains blueberries, um, but it's the only protein I know. I can't think of it. I don't know if it's a vegan one. I don't know if it's like Sun Warrior or something like that. But I know that you know yogurts are the best ones because especially kids yogurts because they have the cartoon characters on and you when you look it actually only contains flavors right. um, whereas if you've ever seen like there's the yogurt ski yogurts they've actually got the fruits on and there's usually fruit bits in those yogurts um, but all foods are the same 
Um, nutritional information must be given um, if a claim is made on the packaging, either if it's low in fat or high in fiber, nutrition breakdown should be for a 100 gram or 100 mil serving. And it's all to do with regulations. Um, all the ingredients should be listed on the foods as well. Which is why when you get stuff that says you can't, it can't be sold individually, that's usually because it's been packeted as a whole package. So if you had like, um, they, they sell like, um, oh, is it like cereal, and usually all the cereal has all the label on the whole packaging. But when you take the package out, it's got individual boxes. The food, the actual information doesn't need to be on the boxes. A little bit like if you buy a pack of, um, uh, I don't know, like, like not biscuits, but like um, chocolate bars. If you buy a pack of like eight, then the, the sometimes the, the actual food label won't be on the chocolate bar, be, be on the actual main packet. So you don't actually know what you're consuming. List of ingredients. Ingredients are listed in descending order of weight. So it may also indicate the use of inexpensive, uh, inexpensive bulking agents, the use of additives such as colorings, flavors, artificial sweeteners, and preservatives. So example, wheat flour, tomato sauce, salt, basil, rapeseed oil, antioxidant. Um, so you're able to look at everything on the food label and see what the highest percentage is first and follow it down. Um, if I'm looking at this, I'm looking at everything that's in it. I'm looking at the fact that it's got sugar, so it's got dextrose, it's got uh, more sugar, it's got um, emulsifiers, it's got E numbers. Um, so I'm looking at all these things that are going to be negative for it. And then when I'm looking at the nutrition label itself, I need to understand what total energy is, the fats, the carbs, and the proteins. And then I then need to work out whether it's any good or not. So for example, for this particular, it's a suitable for vegetarians. It's a cheese and tomato pizza. Um, and I look at that and I think, oh, half a pizza is only 255 calories. I look at the carbs and the sugar and I think, oh, you know what? Actually, that's not bad. But then when you look, the pizza is only 124 grams. That's like a half of a normal slice of Domino's. So it's like a it's ridiculously tiny pizza. So you can imagine, you know, an average size pizza is probably about 700 grams, 800 grams. So when you look at it that way, you think how small that pizza is. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be having that one, to be honest. Um, calculate the percentages of energy derived from fats, carbs, and proteins. So you've got food labels, which shows fats, carbs, and proteins as grams. Um, when calculating percentages, you need to convert these calories to calculate a true percentage. Obviously, you know that percentage now by doing your basal metabolic rate. So when we do it, we will just take the food label, as you can see there. So if we're looking at fats, we're just basically multiplying the grams per nine to work out the total calories that are in each section. And then what we then do is we can then divide it and multiply this number by 100 to get your percentage of fats, carbs, and proteins. Um, obviously, this is really long-winded and a lot of work to do for someone. And eventually, when you get used to it, you'll be able to eyeball it and pretty much work out what it is in terms of percentages and calories. Um, but it's good to know to keep track of what's good and what's bad. Right, so what's the protein requirements then? Protein and carbohydrate. So that's how you work it out. Four, per, four calories per gram. Yeah, so we've both got four. Yeah. Oh, I can't get my calculator up fast enough. The protein? 17%. And then carbohydrates? Uh, 46%. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's your food. So this is like guided daily allowance now. So guided daily amounts. 
um, is obviously based on um, UK guidelines. So they obviously offer a traffic light system as well, which is just here. So you'll see this food. And this, this is a good it's a good idea to give to your um, your customers um, so they know exactly what they need to do all the way through it. You can see that it will do green, amber, and red lights. Um, so traffic labeling, originally devised by the Food Standard Agency for the most up-to-date guidance, you need to go to dh.gov.uk. Offers consumers a simple visualized presentation of energy, fat, saturated fat, salt, and sugar in food products. Red equals high, obviously amber is medium and green is low. Advantages and disadvantages of labeling. Um, trans fats is not a legal requirement to declare the presence or quantity of trans fats in products unless it's, it's a specific low in trans fat claim is made in packaging. Trans flats are widely used by food manufacturers because they're cheap to produce and have a long shelf life. Organic must be grown and produced in accordance to EU laws on organic productions. Fat and sugar, there are legal guidelines and code of practices but labels can be misleading. For example, light and light can be used to mean reduced fat and sugar or alcohol or even salt. It is even used to describe the colour or texture of food. So if something says light, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be low in fat or sugar, so which is why you need to look at the labels. People naturally nowadays will buy something that says light or light um, because they think it's a healthy option, but they won't look at the food labels, and that's a win-win for the manufacturer, for the person that's selling their goods. So it's important when you've got clients to make them aware of those facts and they start looking at labels. Going through food labels with a client is really important. Food person, uh, presentation methods can facilitate healthy eating, steaming, dry frying, grilled and baking. Um, and that's it. Okay. Any questions? That that's it. Um, yeah. Mine is just, are we able to get this presentation? Because I just want to go through it a bit more slowly. Yeah, I'll send you the presentation so you've got it. Thank you. Hey, one um, second. Guys, um, one second uh, before you disappear on me. Can you see me? Yes, hello. Yes, hello. And your dog. Uh, what's his name? His name? His name's Winston. He's only little. Look. Say hello. Uh, let me so cute. How old is he? Um, 13 weeks, isn't yeah. Does he make like really loud breathing noises? Yeah, listen. Wait a Can you hear him? Yeah, it's like he sounds like a little pig. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, lovely. Right, we can get down there, Smilly. Um, right, okay. So I'm pleased we didn't have this on the whole time. I didn't know I could have this on. There's a little green light that goes over here. I'm going to get rid of me now. Okay, so I'll send you the presentation slide so you've got a copy, yeah? Please. Can we just email you a time to do the exam? Yep. What I'll do, if you email me a time and you want to do it, we can just book it in. Okay, Peter, I'll send you your books as well, mate. Um, I'm going to send them out today. I've just got to put them all together. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Ben, could you send me that letter again, if you don't mind? You know, the one you did. I, I, did, I, I did send one out to you, another one. Yeah, I've lost it. Oh, you did it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going to start charging you for admin, you know. Um, okay, no, no, no. I'll, I'll send you another one. Make a photocopy of it. I will this time, yeah, I will. Okay. No worries. Um, how long does the exam take, then? Sorry? How long does the exam take? Um, you get 45 minutes to do the exam. Okay.
So yeah. And is okay. it is, um this uh this PowerPoint that we've been through today um seems to be yep. less detail than the book, so um I mean